stacyblitz.com. What is that in your... Give me that! We'll speak about this later. Confiscate that for now. Hello, Guz Khan here with the one and only Dissy Blitz and they've rolled up to an interview, yeah, with what appears like a 33-year-old piece of plastic. Your Dissy, look at, bruv, look at your, it looks like something from an auntie's hundy drawer, mate, yeah? All the Dissy is scratched off, it's cut, every time, there's more orange that's coming off. Dissy Blitz, thank you very much. You over in the corner, the boy's like, yo, obviously she's a skeptic for a minute. That's what she's like. <laughs> Man, I ain't gonna wife that. You're nine years old, you don't need a wife anyway. Yeah, I know what I'm saying anyway, but... <laughs> But when the time comes, I ain't wait for anybody. Hi, Guz. Thank you so oh, yeah. much for joining us today and speaking with us at Desi Blitz. Uh, just to start off, obviously you've had an amazing career starting from just YouTube videos, well, being a school teacher, going to YouTube videos, uh, to the BBC, and now doing stand-up. How has that journey been for you? Uh, it's been crazy, um, but it's one that I haven't really thought about too much. I think when you start processing how quickly things have changed, um, you start to realise, OK, this is how much effort, this is how much organization, this is how much is required to go into doing what I do. I've, I've always been the kind of person where when I'm doing something, uh, I'm in it, I'm part of it. Uh, I try to enjoy it as much as I can and give it 100% effort. But I think if you step, if I, if I were to step back for a minute, which I haven't really done and processed like three and a half years ago versus now, it's cr it's crazy. And people often tell me, um, you know, it's, it's the fastest movement that they've seen from someone who's literally a novice, which is which is what I was, um, to where I am now. So you just got to enjoy the journey, man. Enjoy the journey. Tell me, Moby. Yes, Cyril. Have you got my weed? Yes, I've got your flipping weed, Cyril. Listen, I ain't supposed to be doing this, you know, bro. I'm trying to stay legit in that. Exactly. But um, going to your show, actually, we've said that you kind of draw from your life. What what was the inspiration for characters like eight? Honestly, I can't look at Tiz Tez Elias without <laughs> laughing now. <laughs> you know, you know the, the beautiful thing with so so for example, Tez, uh, if you watch his stand up, is a very different performer uh, to the character that he plays in the show. But Tez is like eight right he doesn't show it but there's so many elements of the way that he speaks and how quickly he'll speed up his his vernacular when he's with the lads or with me for example and vice versa so a character like eight everybody in their social circle regardless of demographic has a mate like that or they've known a mate like that just the daftest dude of all time but can drop some really like deep insightful bars as well do you know what i mean like you expect them to be plonkers and then they will come and resolve a problem with just something crazy that they say um so he was a really fun character and tez brought so much to the character as well you know um but for, but for me uh, in my own family in my own four walls I, there's elements of me that are like eight uh, and, and vice versa so you tend to find a, a reason why people thankfully which is the way we wrote it and intended it was gravitated to characters in man like Mobin was because everybody recognizes something in them yeah Mobin is uh, outwardly got a huge beard he's South Asian he's living in a hood in Birmingham but there's character traits to him in the fact that he loves his little sister more than anything and he's a sole carer for her. Um, he cares so much for his extended friendship circle. He's trying to do the right things. These are all things not necessarily shown on TV that regularly, especially in a comedy format, but pe that resonate with people, you know? Very, very much like when you look back at the classics like Only Fools, Dow Boy was breaking the law. <laughs> Every single episode, he was selling hooky goods and he was, he, was, he was wheeling and dealing. So he was breaking the law, but you saw a character who was doing that to provide for his family. Um, and so for me, a character like Mobin is reflective of just real life. We've all been there really, so. I completely agree. And um, why I kind of love the show is actually the younger sister acts reminds me a lot of my younger sister. Okay. And despite, <laughs> no, well, that's the thing. I showed her it and I was like, this is how mean you are to me, how she picks on my bean. <laughs> I'm the one usually plaiting her hair or doing her makeup and being bullied yeah. in the same way. But for you, what makes man like my bean, like obviously, You've said how it even has that kind of same kind of realism for everyday life, like only fools and horses. But what makes for you Man Like Me being really special and stand out as a great comedy? Yeah, for me, it's how we take very real life issues, um, quite serious issues really, and still find the humour 
in them as well, you know? So there's so much of life where uh, in, in the new uh, set of four episodes, we explore uh, the element of knife crime amongst young people in this country. Now, when you pitch an idea like that to uh, the BBC, I, I can understand why they might be like, okay, how are you going to make that funny? But the truth is, in the, even the most worst situations, you can find examples of when humour and levity and uh, and human bonds can be found. So, so for me, the outstanding feature of Mobin is that it's it's authentic. That when you watch the show, it doesn't matter where you're from, you feel like you've been transported into Mobin's world. You feel like you're in Small Heath. You feel like you're you're part of his his, his friendship and his family circle. Um, so, being able to create a show with that warmth, but that also looks at the, the rise of the far right wing in this country like episode four did it's it's such a unique show and i'm just glad that we've been able to uh create something that is unique within itself because you know was there was a, a temptation to make you know quite a traditional sitcom um a, a gag every 30 seconds a gag every 15 seconds whatever it might be in a traditional setting. but it kind of that kind of bored me from a creative point of view anyway I, I like watching shows where you know you're having a laugh constantly and it's just a bit silly but you know, I felt the pressure to to create something that was based in realism, authentic, uh, and that's what that's what I think I'm most proud of with the show. Yeah. Dumb kids. Dumb kids. Yeah. Listen, you're a burden on all of us. So why don't you just get to work here in a meth lab and hope for the best, son? Well, actually, even that whole Rishta scene where you've got Uncle Shady, you've got Brother Ahmed, you've got Khadija. Yeah. Where's that come from? Was that based on any real experiences? <laughs> Not for me personally, but uh, <laughs> I uh, I had a few mates, uh, kind of men and women, who went on a traditional arranged marriage meeting. They didn't go through with it, but like a, a meeting. And it is the most awkward... The, the, the word they kept coming up is awkward, awkward, awkward. So writing a scene like that, when I sat down to write, it was like, that's the basis of the comedy. It's finding the humour in the awkwardness. My dad, they got divorced when I was uh, quite young and I haven't seen my old man for the last 20 years. But my mum, she was, she was amazing, man. She, she did everything for us. It's just, she got remarried when I was a teenager, you see, and... Uh... It's a very boring story. For me, when I, when I watched that scene, you can feel it. Do you know what I mean? You can feel, oh my God, imagine being there yourself in that position where essentially you are you are selling yourself to a stranger and then later his daughter, that's what Mobin is there to do. The guy that's bought you doesn't give a shit about you. Do you know what I mean? So it's just, you were there to sell yourself as an entity. Um, and so capturing that awkwardness, the silence, the pauses, I'm the worst at that. Like, if there's silence and something seems awkward, I'll start laughing anyway. Like, even in the most serious of situations you know i've turned up at people's wakes before and it's been a really emotional part of the part of the wake and then like i don't know someone's holding the kid and the kid farts and i was like oh shit, the kid. yeah and then like it just spreads it's crazy i'm so silly for those things so i enjoy watching comedy where everything's being squeezed out the, the awkwardness and then when you have a character like uncle shady like we've we've had those aunties and uncles who don't care there's no limits, there's no rules. They will comment about your face, your weight, your job, your how much of a disgrace you are casually in front of 30 strangers, you know? And so to capture that was was so, so fun. And in that first series was definitely why that scene was uh, single-handedly my favorite scene that we did, yeah. Very funny scene. Because even like you said about the awkwardness, but what was so hilarious, there is always that element of the silly in the awkwardness. Like, like he, pulls it, he pulls him right to the ground and throws Rabina everywhere. And there's you trouncing with um, Khadija all over, over the top of it. Do you, know, do you know, at the end of the day, like there's so many things going on there, but I think the reason why people find it so funny is that even if you're, even if you're not from a family where that kind of thing goes on. First of all, point one is that whether you are from a Muslim, Sikh, Hindu, whatever background it is, those kind of interactions happen, you know, in some form or another. You've always got this slimy cousin that turns up and who's like chatting up your, your sister's best mate, whatever, do you know what I mean? You've, you've got all these elements going on in a room that stinks of tarka. It's unbelievable, do you know what I mean? So to capture that was, was so, so important there. Yeah.
Is this where you kind of find the majority of your material, your, even for stand-up? Like, where do you kind of find your material for that versus maybe TV, which is so much more visual? Yeah, so, so for stand-up, uh, I'm a guy that tells stories so i'm not really like a like a gag kind of guy so again like i said growing up i would always recount a story of something that took place in in hillfields and when i was retelling the story the way i'd be retelling it would make it would be making everyone bust up and when i would replicate jr's accent or Pierce's accent whatever it might be people would laugh so when in my stand-up uh when i tell stories of being a teacher of being an uncle um of of my my time growing up in the areas that I did when I'm telling the stories people are really kind of uh, drawn in because you can hear multiple characters and it just becomes a story that they, they can picture when, they, when they're watching which is what I've heard about my stand-up but also obviously I like to make uh, political commentary as well um, and you know a lot of that will be from uh, a current stance you know you can just take a look at the political landscape in this country at the moment uh you're either gonna laugh or you're gonna cry so you you have to find a balance of the both i think um so with my stand-up it's kind of uh, how i feel really on on any given on any given subject and i think that's all you can really do the world is uh full of systems that are like you do this this and this and you follow the rules stand-up is beautiful because you grab a mic you say what you're gonna say um, some people will laugh, some people won't. Some people will agree, some people won't. And that's just, it's just the, the relationship that you have as a, as a stand-up with a crowd.